Tonight I'm gonna to talk about when Booleans are not enough and how we can use state machines in those cases. My name is Harrington Joseph. I'm a senior software engineer at Netflix where I work in the big data services team. My work is mostly focused on data orchestration and even driven architecture. Please feel free to find me after the talk if you want to know more about what I do at Netflix. Expectations. This talk is about why, how, and when to use state machines. This talk is definitely not about the internals of the state machine. Let's start with a very simple analogy to get everybody on the same page. Imagine that you have a closet where you store tools and sport equipment. This closet is so messy that you don't really want to look at it. You don't want to think about this mess. Reality hits you the moment that you have to get something from that closet and turns out that it's at the bottom of the messy pile that you have in there. You don't really know if you can actually pull it out or not because everything may fall apart. Things were actually worse when you ask someone to get something from that closet for you. This person is probably not going to find what, you're, what you need or what you're asking for. And it's very unlikely that that person is gonna feel comfortable moving things around. This is exactly what happens when we use multiple Booleans to represent states and enforce business rules. The code gets messy and no one wants to touch it. So please raise your hand if you have any class with one of the following attributes. Yeah, I see a lot of hands up. I may have the right audience in the room. So the problem, using Booleans to represent states and enforce business rules. Very simple, we all been there. So let's jump in right into the code. Here we have a video class that the constructor receives a source, which is the source of the video. It initializes the source, uh, an attribute called source with a given source, but it also initializes an attribute called is playing, which in this case is initialized as false because the video is not playing the moment we create an instance of the video. This class also provides three functions, pause, play, and stop. I'm not going to dive into the details of how to pause, play, or stop a video, but the important part here is actually the is playing line. So when we call pause, we set is playing to false. When we call play, is playing is set to true. When we call stop, is playing is set to false. So we go ahead and create an instance of the video. We can play our video. We can pause the video. We can stop the video. And we can even check if the video is playing or not. But video dot is plain, what does it really mean? When it's true, it definitely means that the video is plain. But what happens when it's false? Is it pause or is it stopped? In reality, we don't have enough information to answer this question. So naturally, we'll go and create an is pause attribute. And we initialize this as false because, of course, the video is not paused once we create an instance of the video. And then we modify our functions, and when we call pause, is pause is set to true. When we call play, is pause is set to false. And when we call stop, is pause is set to false. So now, we can definitely answer if the video is playing. We can definitely answer if the video is pause. And sure, we can answer if the video is stop or not. But as you can see, this is already adding complexity in the code. We have to check two attributes in order to answer one simple question. This code is also fragile. The moment that you introduce a new state, this statement is not true anymore. So let's talk about some business rules. A video can only be played when it's paused or stopped. A video can only be paused when it's playing. And a video can only be stopped when it's playing or paused. Very simple rules, just like a regular video player. So now we go and modify our source code and we implement these rules. So we say for the play function to implement rule number one that a video can only be played when it's paused or stop, we basically check if the video is not playing or if the video is paused. In that case, we make the call to play the video and we update our is playing and is paused attributes. If this condition is not satisfied, we raise an exception saying that you cannot play a video that is already playing, assuming that it's already playing. In the case of pause, that a video can only be paused when it's playing, we check if the video is playing. In that case, we make the call to, play, uh, to pause the video, update our attributes, 
Otherwise, we raise an exception saying that you cannot pause a video that is not playing. And for rule number three, that a video can only be stopped when it's playing or paused, we modify our function and we check if the video is playing or if the video is paused. We make the call to, uh, to pause the video, update the attributes, and raise the exception. So our code is rapidly becoming complex. Our play, pause, and stop functions are not actually focusing on what they're supposed to be doing. They're actually checking for the state and enforcing business rules. It's bloated. We added a bunch of code in the functions and we're not getting any functionality. It's repetitive. We keep checking for the states, we keep raising exceptions. Even though they are not the same conditions, they are very similar. And it's definitely hard to test. Writing proper unit tests for this requires that you're going to write all the possible combinations for all the Boolean attributes that you have for every single function, in this case, play, pause, and stop. This is extremely hard to do, right? You're probably going to miss a case, and you're probably going to run into random edge cases. So here's another approach. You may create some constants, uh, playing, pause, and stop, and then instead of creating the Boolean, you create a state in the, in the video, which you initialize the stop because the video is not playing once you create the instance. But when it comes to your play function, you actually don't gain, don't gain much. You're actually just, you continue checking for the state. In this case, you're checking if the video is not playing, then you can play it. You continue raising the exception, same here, and then you also make assumptions. Like for example, in this case, you're saying, if the state is not stopped, then you can stop it. But is that actually true? It is true for the current business rules. But the moment you introduce a new state, this might not be true, and it's really easy to miss because unit tests are going to continue working. So let's talk about state machines. What's a state machine? A state machine is a mathematical model of computation with a finite number of states, transition between states, and a machine that can uh, only be at a state at a given time. All these sounds very theoretical, very mathematical. But in reality, a state machine can be seen as a directed graph, where each of the nodes represents a state, and the connection between nodes are basically transitioned from one state to the other one. So whenever a node is connected to another, when, whenever two nodes are connected, it means that there is a way of transitioning from that node or from that state to the other state. So here's an example. This is a very basic state machine for when a user lands on a website. When the user lands on the website, for the first time, the user is logged out. So that's why you see that green, bluish glow uh, representing that that's the initial state. Once a user is in the logout state, the user can perform the login transition to move to the login state. Once in the login state, the user can perform the logout transition to move to the logout state. So as I said, this is a very simple state machine. So how do we define, how do we design a state machine? First, we need to define a finite number of states. What are the states that we're going to be dealing with? Next, we need to lay down the transition, the transition between states. And these are basically the business rules. What, what rules we want to enforce. And third, we need to select the initial state. Once we create this object or this instance, where is, the, where is it going to start? So step number one, define a finite number of states. In the case of the video, we have plain, pause, and stop. Step number two, lay down the transition between states. We have, uh, the, we have the three states, and if you remember the rules, a video can only be played when it's stopped or paused. That's why you see two incoming arrows to the playing state, one coming from the stop state and one coming from the pause state with the name of play. Rule number two said that a video can only be paused when it's playing. That's why you see only one incoming arrow to the uh, pause state from the playing state with the name of pause. And rule number three said that a video can only be stopped when it's playing or paused. You see two incoming arrows to the stop state, one from playing, one from pause, with the stop name. And finally, we just select the initial state, which in this case is going to be stopped because the video is not playing once we create the instance. So let's take a look at the code. For the presentation purposes, I'm going to rely on this library called Transitions. As I said, I'm not going to dive into the internals of a state machine. 
just how to use it and why to use it. This library is open source. The code is fairly easy to read. You can use this one or you can pick whatever, whichever you want. Uh, there are a bunch of them out there. So the first thing that we need to do is import the machine from the transitions library. And then we define all our states. So far, nothing has changed much from the latest approach. Next, we need to define the transitions. And here is where like, things may look a little bit complex, but in fact, they are not. What we're doing here is basically describing the graph. We're saying that for rule number one, a video can only be played when it's paused or stopped. So that means that we have two transitions for this rule. One is going to go from pause to playing and stop, and the other one is going to go from stop to playing. So that's why you see the first transition where the source is pause and the destination is playing. The second transition is uh, the source is stop and the destination is playing. Notice that the trigger has the name of the arrow, which in this case is play. For rule number two, a video can only be paused when it's playing. That means one transition. And it's gonna, the source of this transition is going to be playing, and it's going to end, or the destination is going to be pause, with the trigger name of pause. And for rule number three, a video can only be stopped when it's playing or pause. Two rules, two new transitions. One is going to go from the playing state to the stop state, and the other one is going to go from the pause state to the stop state. Notice that the trigger name is called stop. The trigger name in the, is important in this case because it should match the name of the function of the object that is going to be used. So in this case, we're saying that there's got to be a function called play, pause, and stop. And finally, we just need to create the machine. When we create the machine, we say model equals self. And I go over this in a moment. This is something very important. And then we provide the list of transitions that we just defined, as well as the initial state, which in this case is going to be stop. Now our functions actually look very simple. As you can see, I have basically have no code here. I'm just making the call to pause the video, play the video, or stop the video. There is no more logic about checking the state or enforcing any business rules. The function is basically going to focus on what they're supposed to be doing. So now we can we continue creating the video instance the same way. We can play the video, and our state should transition to playing. We can check the state, and it should be playing. We can pause the video, and the state should be paused. We can stop the video, and the state should be stopped. But what happens if we call pause again? Remember, a video can only be paused when it's playing. But we're in the stop state we get a machine error. The machine is enforcing the business rules that we provide. We get this for free. We didn't have to write a single if to enforce this. We basically feed the machine with the rules that we wanted to enforce, and the machine is taking care of validating these transitions. Remember that I said uh, that when you create the machine instance, model equals self is very important. That's how the machine actually do, uh, take care of this. The way it works is that when the machine is going to look for all the functions that match the name of the triggers. And it's going to wrap all these functions with some machine logic. And in this logic, what it's doing is enforcing the business rules. And if the rule is satisfied, it calls the function. If the rule is not satisfied, it gives you a machine error. Once it calls the function, the function executes. If, ex if the execution is successful, then it updates the state. If for some reason there is an error in your function, the, the exception is going to be propagated, and this state is not going to change. So how do we test this? We don't. <laughs> if you're using a, a, a state machine library, you don't really have to focus on testing that you can transition from one state to another one. You don't really have to focus that the business rules are enforced. Instead, you can focus on testing that the machine was initialized with the right transitions and with the right initial state. And then you can focus all your efforts on testing the play, pause, and stop functions without caring about the state. So let's add a new state. And let's go to this state rewinding. So here are the new rules. I'm highlighting in red everything that has changed. 
So rule number one now says that a video can be played when it's paused, stopped, or rewinding. Rule number two says that a video can be paused when it's playing or rewinding. Rule number three says that a video can be stopped when it's playing, paused, or rewinding. And the brand new rule is that a video can only be rewinding when it's playing or paused. So if you look at the graph, now it looks a little bit more complex. There are more arrows and there is a new state, which is the rewinding state. As you can see in the graph, the rewinding state has only two incoming arrows, one coming from the playing state and one coming from the pause state with the name rewind. These arrows are basically representing the fourth rule. Then, then the outgoing rules, the outgoing arrows from the rewinding state are basically representing the additional part of the other rules that has changed. So now, this is what's changing the code. And this is literally all we had to do. We created a new state, and now we're enforced, we have defining the new transitions. So rule number one, that a video can only be played when it's paused, stop, or rewinding. We added a new transition saying that you can move from the rewinding state to the playing state with the name of play. That's a trigger name. For rule number two, a video can only be paused when it's playing or rewinding. There is a new transition rule that goes from the rewinding state to the pause state with the, name, with the trigger name of pause. For rule number three, a video can only be stopped when it's playing, pause, or rewinding. We added a new transition rule that goes from the rewinding state to the stop state with the name of stop. And for the brand new rule, uh, the number four, uh, we added two transitions, same, meaning that a video can only be rewinded when it's playing or paused. So in this case, we have one transition that goes from the playing state to the rewinding state, and another one that goes from the pause state to the rewinding state. Both have a trigger name called rewind. All these changes um, are completely fine in our existing code base. They are not going to break any unit tests, or in fact, they may only break one unit test, which is the one that checks that the machine was initialized with the right transitions. But the, the unit tests that we wrote to test the play, pause, and stop functions are going to continue working, and you can be sure that they don't have any, um, any missing condition or anything like that, because these functions are not focusing on checking the state anymore. Now all we have to do is write unit tests for the rewinding function and write the rewinding function. The rewind function, sorry. So when are Booleans not enough? When you have multiple Booleans representing a single state. If you find yourself checking multiple Booleans, or not even Boolean, multiple attributes or multiple values in order to decide the state of an object, we're probably doing something wrong. And when the business rules are enforced by multiple Booleans, if you have to check a lot of uh, variables or Booleans in order to decide if you can transition from one state to the other one, if an object can perform certain action, then something smells fishier. There's got to be a better way of doing this. So when do we use state machines? When states are no binary. When you have something more than true or false, yes or no, one and zero, you may want to consider using a state machine. When you have to account for future states. And this is not about over-engineering. We're really good at that, by the way. Um, but it's a fact, it's knowing for a fact that the state is going to keep growing. It's going to keep evolving. That you need to add new states. That later you're going to have to enforce new business rules. You know for a fact that that's the, the, that is going to happen. Then you definitely want to consider using a state machine because the code is going to evolve quite rapidly and it's become, going to become a mess. And then when you have to enforce a complex set of business rules, as you saw, we were only talking about a video, a video player that is fairly simple. Look at the amount of transitions that we had. If we're talking about more complex businesses, these can get really hairy. So in summary, I would like you to consider using state machines to represent states and enforce business rules. As you saw in the presentation, when you use Booleans to do this, your code gets unreadable, unmaintainable, prone to errors, and really hard to test. On the other hand, when you use state machines, you remove the amount of complexity from the code, and you reduce the amount of unit tests that you have to write. The moment you add a new state, you don't keep branching out and adding a ton of new unit tests. One thing that is important to mention is the state machines are not a silver bullet. So it's not like a one solution to rule them all and this is gonna solve all my problems. 
Know your tools, think about the problem that you're trying to solve, and decide if adding a state machine makes sense and reduce the amount of complexity of your problem. That's all I have, thank you very much. Now, if we have time, I would like to take some questions. All right, Crazy the microphone is coming here. Hi, what are your feelings on a bit lag for video state? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, bit flags. Bit flags. Bit flags. <laughs> I mean, you're just talking about video states in general, but like this is like a more general view, like a uh, like a global approach to that to a general problem. Uh, you, you uh, printed the error. You 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 if if the state is not right, but sometimes state is has warning, like uh, if you're in pause state, uh, you know you, maybe it's acceptable to hit pause again. Or, I'm sorry, I meant, uh, you understand what I'm saying? You are doing, you are throwing exceptions yeah. if the state is not right. But right. sometimes it may not be that severe, right? You can say, oh, this is okay, we can ignore it. Right, we well. can ignore this state. So uh, my question is for you is how are you going to handle that, that case? Right, so I was raising exceptions in the, in, in the example that I was showing you the wrong approach. Uh, when I moved to the state machine, I wasn't raising exceptions anymore. I was letting the machine handle the errors for me. So if, uh, if I have a state that might, be an er that might not be that nice, but it's still valid, then you probably have to define a transition for it. <clears throat> have you used any uh, libraries to visualize uh, the state machine, like generate a, a diagram? Uh, I believe uh, you can export, once you build the state machine, you can actually export it to dot format, and then you can use any dot visualizer for it. Uh, so I have something that looks like it would be a great fit for this, except some of the uh, Boolean flags are actually computed properties. Um, is there anything I can do to make that fit a state machine paradigm? Um, yes, so as you saw, uh, the, stop, um, the stop state was actually being computed by combining two booleans in this case. So yeah, we, could, we, can, we can definitely do that and just create a property that encapsulates that, but that doesn't remove the complexity on your side. It might hide the complexity for someone that is making use of your class, but it definitely, like, if you pass your class to someone else that has to maintain it and deal with it in, for like multiple years or who knows, or make more changes and stuff like that, that's not going to solve the problem for that person. And it's going to get worse if he actually comes back to you. So I, am, I would say if you can translate all the Boolean logic into transitions, like just start drawing that on the board. It actually gets really easy once you start like laying out the transitions. You will probably move away from that. Yeah, I have a question. So first of all, uh, thank you for the talk. This is a great technique. Um, a lot of times in state machines, it's important to be able to handle substates. And I was just you know, looking up transitions on my phone and I didn't really see how they do it. Are, are there um, packages that can do that in Python? I, I haven't actually had to handle that use case specifically. Uh, you can probably create internal same, uh, state machines as well. But I, uh, I've been looking through the code of uh, transitions. It's actually fairly simple, but it can also get really complex to support more advanced features. So uh, right. I, I'm not 100% sure that it supports that, but I, I invite you to check it out. Because for anybody who runs into that, there's something called Harrell state charts that okay. were documented about 30 years ago by David Harrell, and they're great for this, but I don't know if there's a package in Python that no idea. them. No idea. Thank you. Um, it seems like the logic be behind the state machine is pretty like Markov chain, especially when it comes to those transition. So my question is, for example, if you want to build a model to predict the user's behaviors, when they, when they pause, when they play the video. Is there any, does this package support Markov chain, stuff like that? I, again, I'm not 100% sure because that hasn't been my use case. Maybe it does, I, I, as I said, just check it out. The package is very rich, and if it's not this one, then you can probably find an equivalent package. Question over there. Any more questions? Where do we get the slides? Um, Aaron, do we have to start the slides?
We'll put it. We'll put. There is. We actually have a bunch of past slides in our GitHub page, and then we'll put it on the um, comments. Yeah. Would that work? Yeah. Also, if you if you follow me on Twitter, I'll post the slides. Yeah, follow him on Twitter. <laughs> cool. So thank you so much for your time and sharing. Thank you for having me.